I said I had an Ira Glass tattoo, and then what did you say about it? I said, uh, I better start recording because you're going to say something weird. Oh. This is a real, real, real thing. Real, 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 real thing. None of you have the balls to stop. Stop this. We're in the wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right it's a it's a stencil tattoo that my friend designed for me way back in the day, which is early two thousands, and um, it's a really cool tattoo. But it has an American flag on the back of it, or like it's an American flag, and then it's his face. Um, I can send you a picture of it so you can like add it to the podcast or something. And uh, it's a uh, it's a great tattoo. It's super well done, super well drawn to begin with. And um, he actually interviewed me on the phone about it because when he was living, so when I got it done, it was when his show was still being made in Chicago and I was living in Milwaukee. And so as a 20 something in Chicago or in college, I was like, well, since y'all are like so close in Chicago, maybe you'd want to like come up and I don't know, document me getting a tattoo of Ira Glass in Milwaukee. And oh, because it was right when they were starting their TV show. Did you know that This American Life had a TV show for a while? Uh, I may have been aware of that. How how long has it been since that was on the air? Almost 20 years now, probably. Really? Yeah, or 15 years. So I was like, oh, with this visual medium, I don't know. I was just pitching them stories. Clearly, I wanted to be a journalist. So I told them about it. And the next email back I got was Ira Glass emailing me. And he was he emailed me back when I was in a media class that I was teaching. It was in a computer lab because it was media writing. So everybody had a computer because we didn't have laptops, personal laptops back then. And uh, he wanted to talk to me on the phone. Hmm. So I sat in my friend's garage chain smoking Camel Light cigarettes and talked to Ira Glass about the state of independent media in the early 2000s. Hmm. Was he concerned for you? I, I would was. be concerned for someone who got a tattoo of me. He was. But once he found out that I was really dedicated to independent media and that I liked the like ethos of this American life and was really dedicated to teaching others about independent media, he kind of he got it more. Um but it's still like a really weird tattoo to have, but it's really, it's also just really cool. Um, I better cut this yeah. off because if I let you go any, any longer, I will feel obligated to include this in the episode and then you'll feel bad when you don't hear it included in the episode. Right? That's great, John. So good to see you. Uh, this is the Wedge Live podcast. I'm your host, John Edwards. Haven't seen you for a while, uh, audience or Melody. Uh, I haven't felt like talking to anyone. That's... That's what that comes down to. I've talked to so many people. Sometimes you get tired of talking to people. Uh, here's your theme song, Melody at Southwest Voices dot News. This is your theme song. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Monthly with Melody. Where I share all the news for you and me. Monthly with Melody. Let's get down to it. John and me. Three, two, one, let's go. And what else has been going on in your life? Anything else happening? Um, Bryant Avenue is almost finished. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, it's a totally different street, as everybody knows. Um, so that's pretty wild. I always feel some kind of way about people riding on it when it's not completely done because the the like lanes aren't drawn on the on the bike area and some of the curbs aren't completely done so it's not like the safest to be perusing down cruising down i should say i've been riding it are you I worried mean, yeah, you can fall in the ditch but to the side no kind of yeah just ride yeah, in some, a straight line pay attention you'll be fine well or, I don't know. Some people are having some issues with the with the ditches, but oh. 
we're all just going to, we adapt to change, don't we, John? We do. I think it's going to be fine. Uh, Brian Avenue is going to come up in this conversation because we're here to talk about Ward 13. I know it's not officially a Wedge Live battleground, but we're going to do a whole episode, most of an episode at least, on it anyway. Uh, the race for city council in Ward 13. If you haven't been paying attention, this is an election year in Minneapolis. All 13 wards on the city council are up for a vote. If you live in Minneapolis, you get to vote for uh, your city council representative this year. The mayor's not on the ballot. And uh, Ward 13 is an interesting one. Uh, Kate Mortensen challenging Linnea Palmasano. I, I tend to focus mostly on the two that I see as viable. And it's interesting because they're both, I think they both are moderates and they both see themselves as moderates, I think. Although Palmasano might be the type who, like, no, how dare you call me a moderate? I am deeply progressive. But I think Mortensen has an accurate assessment. If you're talking about the spectrum of council members who exist in reality here in Minneapolis, Palmasano's on the moderate end, uh, the very moderate end. Uh, Melody, why did you want to come here and talk about this? We both witnessed a Ward 13 candidate forum. Was that last Thursday? Wednesday or Thursday. Who can, who can even remember when, what day things happen anymore? Somebody's no... fact checking us as we're saying that it was when it was the Wednesday, it was Thursday. Somebody's yeah. yelling at us right now. There was no internet in the church. I couldn't live tweet it. I took uh, some notes. I tweeted them out. You wrote a thing for Southwest Voices News about it. What struck you? Why do you? Why did you agree to come here today to talk about this? Well, on the evening of the forum, I was reflecting that it was like a just a a remarkable forum in that it was lively. <laughs> there was a lot to banter. The questions that were asked by the League of Women Voters were was like they were r really good questions to ask the candidates um, and the candidates answered them each in their own like style. Like so I thought it was just a really good forum for people to attend as voters. Um, but then after I wrote my article about it and was talking with some people about the forum, um, I think the forum and the people that are running in this district also just represent a, a wide host of, of like, these are just like, it's so representative of what can happen in a campaign in terms of the different kind of candidates that can come come up in a, in an election um, in terms of like the broad spectrum of, um, I guess, positionality. So like far left, progressive, moderate, rep all the way to Republican with Bob Carney. Um, and then also like I was thinking about it from a journalistic standpoint about like, well, then who do you include? Like when you said, oh, I'm focusing on Mortensen and Paul Masano. Um, as like the true the two viable candidates. Um, then I was like thinking about like actually back when I was in, in journalism school and media school, how would how we would actually like critique that and think about how we talk about candidates during the these campaign seasons and how that kind of viewpoint actually cre maintains this like major two party system and doesn't actually allow us to have a, a greater conversation about um, a bigger uh, a party system that goes beyond like these two big parties um, and just kind of focusing on the two main players this like either or creates a host of issues in the in the political system so but I you know so we could go super broad there so those are all the things I was thinking about when I was talking to you about coming on the program today in my defense uh, Bob Carney has again Bob again, Carney has again in his middle name because he knows we're all tired of seeing him as a perennial candidate. His whole shtick, and he's self-aware when it comes to this, is that he's the perennial candidate. Uh, did he? Pro I thought he promised not to win, and that Paul. No, he promised if he did win, he would let Paul Masano uh, take office. That's not legal, I don't think. But uh, you can't just designate who, and he's not going to win, but. I just tuned him out. It, everything he said, and I feel like the old man who no longer has a self a sense of humor, because I didn't find anything he said funny. It was ridiculous, and people were laughing and enjoying it in the room. 
it was a very like jovial backslappy kind of candidate for him, which is unusual. But uh, I wasn't laughing, and I feel like the dud in the room who didn't find Bob Carney funny at all and doesn't even want to talk about him. He mentioned he has an invention of a tuxedo straight jacket. He's got all these harebrained uh, ideas. I don't know if he intends them to be jokes or he, if he takes them seriously. But he's just he's wasting everyone's time, and I feel like talking about someone like Bob Carney is wasting voters' time. If they're just here to like make a decision about who represents them on the city council... Do we waste their time with comments from, like, a guy who even thinks he's a joke candidate, I think? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, and I think, like, in writing about the forum, that is why I immediately immediately said up front that if he, if he would win, that he wouldn't even take the oath of office and would turn his seat over to Lene Palmasano, which is not legal. So that that line in itself completely kind of voids everything else after that right so it's like so readers know that going forward when you when you hear him but then does that mean that nobody wants to hear what he said then for the rest of the night after i say that part right or after that is known does that mean that no reader would like to hear from him like that's the things that you have to think about when you cover this kind of stuff as like a as a journalist, you know, I'm not, I could include you in that, but you make, you make your own editorial choices. But, um, as somebody who's like trying to cover like, oh, what happened in this forum? It felt weird to quote, especially cause I was quoting everybody else, but then not to quote him. It's like, well, was that an error then that you like forgot to quote him? Right. So when it made sense to, I would throw in a quote by Bob Carney, but to like leave him out on purpose, um is like a is like a very intense thing to do as a journalist like that is the thing that we are taught not to do is to like leave out a voice on purpose uh well he put you in that position by showing up lots of times you come up against time limits in these forums because you've only got 90 minutes you got four mm -hmm. candidates and he was wasting everyone's time by being there they could have heard more from the real candidates yeah if he had not been there with the campaign that he, even he admits is not serious. Well, I would just say that the the process, the, the format that we have set up in Minneapolis allows him to run like this. So It's true. He can pay the fee and he can get his name again. Anybody can. I mean, would we be saying this if it was a socialist urbanist person who was just running on if, the Hennepin Avenue bus lane who knew that they weren't going to run uh, or win? Mm -hmm. If they had serious things to say, that's another thing. Not only does he yeah. think he realizes he can't win. I think a lot of candidates realize either I can't win or I'm a long shot. Uh, he has no serious ideas. Like yeah. The, the tuxedo straight yeah. jacket. And, uh, and you didn't mention that in your article, but he said a lot of like off the wall things. He he's, did. Yeah. He's wasting everyone's time. Yeah. He really is. Yeah. He's not adding a point of view. Bob, Bob again, Carney does not represent a point of view in Minneapolis. He's just throwing out weird comments for laughs, I think. Well, he also is running as a Republican and said that he wanted to run as a Republican because in a, you know, in a democracy, it's good to have, yeah. all you know, Republican and a Democrat run. But then he goes beyond that. So. Well, Bob, Bob again, Bob wins again because we talked about him. Is the, <laughs> spent so much time talking about him. Uh, Melody, what is this election about? I struggle with this question uh, all year. Uh, usually I can tell what an election is about. I don't know what this election is about because you'd think it would be public safety because you hear about that a lot from people. But like the police staffing question is not really at stake here because we have... We elected uh, a more moderate to conservative city council last time. The The officer minimum in Minneapolis is still in place, and yet fewer officers than we've ever had. The idea that what happens in this election will cause that chart to tick back up or down, like that, that line is just a runaway train going where it wants, and election results are not going to impact it. At best case, we're we're years away from getting close to what people think is the minimum necessary as 
as it's in the charter. So uh, back to my original question, what is this election about? From whose perspective? Like, like what do uh, we think is at stake? Yeah, what are the stakes? And you don't have to include just one perspective in that. I'm just... With, what's the reason for voting for a moderate in yeah. general? What's the reason for voting for a progressive? Like, what what, what are the stakes? Sure. Well, I think we've seen over the last year, two years, um, what the more leftist candidates, or sorry, what the more leftist council members have been trying to push on council. So that would be... Um, Chugtai, Chavez, Wansley, Payne, I guess, but it's like Chugtai and Wansley and Chavez are introducing these these motions mostly. So if those are the things that you've liked and supported over the last couple of years, then as a voter, you want to be voting for council for candidates that support and like kind of mirror those values because then the idea is to have a city council, that would have more of those people on council. So then those things could get passed through. It would be more likely that those things would be passed through. And then the same could be said for the more in this city, it would be seen as more moderate ca candidates. Um, so council members like Paul Masano and Koski, um, for sure, um, representing a more moderate progressive, I guess you could say in the city, um, form of politics that seem to be more in line with what Mayor Fry has been suggesting and um, leading on, then you want to be voting, looking for candidates. So if those are the things that you've been supporting and agreeing with over the last couple of years, then you want to be looking for candidates um, and, and existing council members that support and align with those values. So I think that's what this, this election is coming down to, is at the, in November, what is our city council who are we voting in? And then what is that council going to then look like in January? Right? I mean, I think that that's what it is, is like, what are the who, what voters are going to show up in November? Is it going to be more of the moderate voters or more of the leftist progressive? I don't know, moderate progressive, leftist progressive? Is that can we call it? Because everybody doesn't, nobody wants to be not a progressive, I guess. Yeah, I think I think what I'm getting at with this question, and it's unanswerable, is like, what is motivating people and i'm worried i'm getting that at, I'm what getting i just at, said yeah yeah but l let me expand on that like okay i am concerned that people are voting with the idea that like the existence of police is still on the ballot and like oh you can vote for a specific candidate and they will like if you vote for somebody who panders to you on police issues well therefore uh, I'm going to see just a bunch more police in my neighborhood. That's what I want. And that's what I'm going to get if I vote for someone with the right positions. And like this issue is beyond anyone's individual positions. Uh, the progressive, the more in the center progressive council we had last time gets a lot of blame for making the police department go away. And I, I always think the police department made themselves go away. Yeah, like they killed George Floyd. They decided uh, too many people in this city think we're we're garbage. We're a dysfunctional organization. We're abusive, and like the state and federal uh, investigations have really concur with that. And they didn't want to stick around to deal with that. The police department is gone because you know blame yourself. I'm curious about this this idea of that certain candidates or certain council members are going to deliver more police um kate mortensen and kind of st started to suggest that with addressing the the rise i don't know if she's i don't want to put words in her mouth so like but addressed the crime in southwest right um, which is flat i'm gonna say kate mortensen uh robberies which is what i look at uh, because it includes carjackings. It's all inclusive of robberies, no matter what the vict how the victim was traveling. Robberies, robberies are flat in Ward 13, and that's the thing that people bring up the most. So individual victims of crime, uh, it's it's tragic, it's sad, it shouldn't happen. But it's it's not like Ward thir Ward 13 is not seeing a, a wild increase in robberies. It's flat. 
but I'm sorry for interrupting. No, 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 that's okay. I just wonder how how far that idea actually tracks now that we've gotten so much media attention over the low levels of police that we have in this city. So while that argument worked really well in 2021, 20, 20, 21? 21. Um, wow. Um, I don't know if people if that logically actually makes sense to people anymore, because there are no police to shuffle around. I, I don't know if people understand that, if that message has gotten out, if they're connecting the dots, I guess, like the police chief is saying, we don't have enough officers. So then I don't think people, I hope people are connecting the dots then and understanding that like, actually, and I don't think city council people or candidates are going to, they're not going to with due consciousness, good consciousness say anything close to that I can deliver more police to you because that's a total sham anyways, right? So we should look out for that messaging, but I would hope, I mean, that is, th that's not even, I know you're not suggesting that it's a, a, a realistic argument to, to, to be made right now, but what I'm adding to this conversation is like that it's so even further from the truth now right. with, with news stories. Yeah. A lot of news stories about I it. Think that voters, I think voters pick up on cues. Like, are you sending me the right cues to indicate you are the pro-police candidate? Are you using the right buzz phrases? Yeah. And if I see the candidate using the right buzz phrases, yeah. therefore, I believe electing that more conservative uh, or moderate candidate will deliver more police for me. And that's what's motivating my vote. But to get back to Ward 13, I think Kate Mortensen has been... Uh, maybe commendable, maybe maybe that's the wrong uh, word to use, but like accurately descri describing some of what I think the stakes are by sort of admitting we need more support for things like the behavioral crisis response team teams that Minneapolis mm -hmm. has had. These alternatives, uh, maybe I should read the thing she wrote in the Star Tribune here. I just decided to take my ticking clock down. Could you hear the click the talks? No, but occasionally I can hear you tapping on the table, a melody. So as a professional podcaster, I have to advise you tapping on the table will distract from what you're trying to communicate. Oh, you mean when I was taking notes or was I tapping on? Oh, was I tapping I think, on the table when I was talking? Yeah, sometimes people will tap on the table when they're talking. It's like a nervous tick, but just realize your high quality microphone is picking that up. So here's, 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 here's what ca council, uh, here's what Kate Mortensen wrote. Uh, title why a city hall clash of moderates matters uh is the title are you gonna read the whole thing no oh but uh the, the part about bcr i might read some okay. other selections too council moderates have been slow to get behind behavioral crisis response alternative to armed policing history isn't on their side originating in the beleaguered office of performance and innovation and championed by the left on the council a more robust bcr is what the department of justice wants to see Sooner implementation of such modern public safety practices could be reducing the workload of our depleted MPD ranks today. Instead, sworn officers will answer, still answer too many calls in circumstances neither the cops nor the community wants. So I think that's like a pretty good take on what the stakes are public safety wise. Like police, police is going to do what the police staffing is going to do. It's kind of beyond beyond us at this point yeah we ought to get yeah. we ought to be getting behind things that will uh supplement what we can't do with police because whether you think police should be doing it or not they don't have the staffing to do it so you ought you ought to find ways to supplement it and uh make sure they're not responsible for it mm -hmm. so good job kate morrison yep so are we giving her like a gold star on that answer or something or uh, I give you a gold star for communicating something in a way that's not pandering not totally unrealistic uh which is a good way to transition to the distinctions uh, between the candidates oh yeah i don't want to sound like a kate mortensen shill because she upset me greatly with her transportation platform i have good things to say about paul Masano too but uh the idea that paul Masano is a manager Mm -hmm. That's what Mortensen said yep. uh, about mm -hmm. Palmasano. I think that's accurate. And I don't even think it's like that disparaging. Palmasano admits she doesn't like the spotlight. Uh, to be a little disparaging of Palmasano, I think I, I can't see what 
her agenda is, what she's trying to accomplish. She, I think of her, she doesn't really have things she wants to do. She's just managing the situation as it is. So in that way, I tend to agree with Kate Mortensen's framing of her. And then Mortensen is positioning herself as like the sort of more active, the doer, the person who will get things done, uh, more of a leader. I Yeah, I would say um, I, I really grasp on Mortensen had some really good messaging, strong messaging in her answers at the forum last week of an, an unknown day. And <clears throat> one of the, the strong points was being a leader versus a manager. Um, and I'm definitely, I'm not in like a position where I want to like judge that statement, but I think it was a really strong message. And, um, I know that what you were saying about Palmasano not having a necessarily a vision or like, um, an agenda that she's working towards. I know that that had come up during the rent control policy discussion, not at the forum, but previously in city council where, um, where Palmasano had said multiple times that like there were a lot of rent control things that she did support and she did name those in the forum by the way um but that like she was not she wasn't coming forward with her own proposals and so that was um one of the discussions that was had is that like council member chug and at the time osman came forward with this proposal for rent con control policy but the, the people that were the people on the council that were voting against it weren't coming forward with their own policies but were saying no we don't like this one and so i think that's an example of what Mortensen might be talking about of like you like you're managing what's going on right now as you said John but you're not coming forward with your own unique vision yeah um, and I think that's a really interesting thing to think about as a, and and I think you know when you get used to the same leader over and over that you're voting for because you trust them thinking about are you bringing forward new ideas is uh yeah it's an interesting thing to think about yeah Mortensen said uh Essentially, it's not enough just to vote no on things. I think uh, at one point, Paul Lozano took credit for like, these are these are lonely votes that I took for you. I think she used mm -hmm. the phrase lonely votes. And then Mortensen's like lonely votes in opposition, as in I was the only council member or among a few council members voting against and people were mean to me because I took a bad vote and I did it for you kind of thing. I'm mm -hmm. editorializing. Mm -hmm. And Mortensen was like, it's not enough to vote uh, vote no on these things like what are you gonna do essentially and that was uh one of the other themes from the thing mortensen wrote in the star tribune is uh, uh she's got this this theme about uh, the city is being pulled to the left because of basically the failure of moderates to address these these big issues and mortensen is the one who will go in and fix it which i th i sympathize with paul masano here because the idea that you can elect me and I'm going to change everything is a dangerous, a dangerous message to have and maybe not so realistic. <laughs> maybe it's not all about you uh, going in and fixing it all yourself. And Paul Masano is like, uh, this is one of the things I find endearing about Paul Masano is she's incredibly awkward and soft-spoken, uh, which I identify with. A awkward, soft-spoken, like I'm the I've got this serious internal side that you don't see. I'm I'm behind the scenes. I don't want to be on stage performing my politics for everyone. I'm mm -hmm. very serious and I'm handling things behind the scenes. I may not be lovable and uh, hilarious and personable uh, at this candidate forum, but you should see me at City Hall behind the scenes. I'm just getting things done, which I don't think is really true. But like I, I find Paul Masano, Paul Masano's, uh, I, I'm attracted to that personality type, basically is what I'm saying in a politician. Mm -hmm. But uh, she's really turned me off with uh, some of her uh, votes over the years. I don't, I don't think there's any leadership there. In other words, I have a question for you. Yeah. If if Wedge Live and Southwest Voices teamed up with all of our money and we didn't exit poll after the forum last week. What do you think the results would have been? 
I don't know, because there's a question of, like, who goes to these candidate forums. Oh, obviously, but we saw who was there. Right, and I don't know who they... So, one of the well, things... Well, there were, like, older... There were the, the older people that lived in... Yeah. And could, I don't know demographics, but... Could skew I would say long long-time voters, right? So, I think yeah. these would be the people that um, probably voted mostly for Paul Mosano. I mean, I think one of... Palmasano's best lines was at the end in her closing remarks when she turned to everybody and she just said, you know me. <laughs> and I was like, dang, they do. Uh, that didn't, that like, didn't knock me over. Well, I think it's, at, I'm at still one point, saying like. Mortensen was like, she called Brian Avenue social engineering. One of her Brian Avenue lines, attack lines which is upsetting to me. One of Mortensen's uh, campaign platforms that's upsetting to me. Uh, she got like, she got the audience to groan over Bryant Avenue. And I, I interpreted that as like people approving of Kate Mortensen's attack on Bryant Avenue and groaning at the idea of Bryant, the new Bryant mm -hmm. Avenue with uh, mm -hmm. less parking and more space for bikes and just a slower overall street. And uh, so I don't know if the audience was tilted in Mortensen's favor, but the people who go to a candidate forum are like politics nerds. And it's good to see lots of people at a candidate forum because I worry that people just don't hear what the candidates are saying. Like they get, they get the mail and they hear some buzz phrases and they vote with their team. And I think it's like sometimes the candidate who may be on your team is kind of incompetent or potentially if you elect them corrupt and so you should really go listen to a candidate forum. You don't have to go in person. You can watch the live stream, but like, listen to what the candidates are saying. Yes. Cause uh, that's very important. Okay. Here's my, okay. I'm going to change the question. If we did, if Southwest voices and wedge live combined our giant pools of money and did like a before and after poll, like you take the poll, you know, like before the forum and after the forum, I'm like who, who like rank choice voting let's yeah. just say right i th i think after after the forum people's minds would have shifted right because you got more information about the candidates to who who do you think won some people over zach and kate yeah that makes sense people because were laughing only because you didn't know anything about them and right. now you do know things about them so i think because everybody knows things about uh paul masano because she's been the council person right yeah but you finally got to know some like real information on positions on zach and kate zach metzger we haven't talked about but zach zach metzger is what i would say like the more leftist um candidate um he's younger than everybody he's the person of color on the on the slate um and not a viable candidate according to john edwards it's true um but uh, hey, you know is... why? So he had a website where he's running in Ward 11 earlier this year. So I don't know if he didn't realize he was in Ward 13. Also, I don't know if someone who was out like burning dumpsters in Uptown uh, two years ago is like going to be uh, elected to the city council in Ward 13. I don't know. That's not a campaign platform of his, but that's like the last time I saw him engaging in uh, politics was uh, in Uptown two years ago. Yeah, but that still doesn't mean he can't be building a political career right now, starting in Ward 13 as a city council candidate. I, I don't see a future for him in Ward 13. Doesn't mean also, that I don't know what is progressive about him necessarily. Like, it rejects, rejects uh, the idea of rent stabilization. Like, has largely I know, the that's same positions huh? as Paul Masano is against the 2040 plan. Like, in stronger terms than even Paul Masano is against the 2040 plan. The only thing that was like even vaguely progressive was the the roof depot stuff. Yeah. And uh maybe some they, they didn't get very specific on policing. I thought like the framing over like how many monitors should we have for the federal and state consent decrees, mm -hmm. like two, one or two. Like that that is not a consequential uh topic when it comes to police reform how many monitors we have like we have two consent decrees if we have one monitor for both and the state agrees like they should not conflict it's not going to be a problem how many monitors we have i just thought the whole the conversation about uh 
police at the forum was not very deep. No, no. Well, I, I guess if you read the interview with Southwest Voices, too, you would know that Zach Metzger is more of a leftist. I just have done more research oh. on him because I'm just going to call it for well, him. Well, since I'm not going to talk about him very much, why don't you tell us what what is... Uh... What, what's what are his leftist credentials he, um c- climate change he's definitely like a young like climate change is everything kind of candidate I, um, I didn't hear that from him at the forum homelessness encampment homelessness like really serious about like getting a more um immediate solution to to end um the encampment situation much more like black lives matter phrasing y- y- you know, listen to black people, listen to indigenous people, like I said, in, like I quoted in the article, much more activist oriented in his, in like how he talks and how he works with community members and organizes. It's very great. His campaign's very grassroots. So um, you are correct that like, it is very unlikely that he is going to win, but he's still um, an exciting candidate for people in war 13 i do i do agree that if you came to that candidate forum not knowing anything he probably would have won you over but like i think the people who are not going to vote for him probably felt better about him like he made them laugh and people who like i'm just fed up with uh, these moderates and i'm looking for a progressive if you came there looking for that like you probably left that forum like oh yeah i'm all about this zach metzger guy for sure. Yeah, I think there's something for everybody, not something for everybody in that room, but you definitely felt like you had options after that forum if you're a Ward 13 resident. Should we talk about Mortensen's uh, positions on transportation? See, here's the thing about, about Paul Masano. What is Mortensen's position on transportation? Are you asking that facetiously or uh, do you really not know? Um. Well, I guess I don't fully know besides her not being a fan of the Bryant Avenue. So we talked about buzz phrases and like these, these cue phrases that you can take things. Yeah. From. One of them for me is when you talk about uh, a street reconstruction that includes a bike path and maybe less parking mm-hmm. and you call it social engineering uh, or you say oh. we're prioritizing bikes over cars, like in a negative way, uh, because for uh, generations we have prioritized cars ahead of all other things and we have ended up with a very messed up uh, system uh, uh, in terms of streets and infrastructure to the point where you can't walk and bike safely and transit sucks and so yeah, we need to readjust those things and cars are going to lose some of that space and when you call that social engineering what the hell have we been doing for the last couple of generations social engineering our, our streets for cars like we made a big mistake like i i hope uh people see that and so it's kind of offensive to me when you call uh, uh street reconstruction social engineering just because you want to make it easier to walk and bike places I, I don't like that at all but in her favor is she's willing to talk to me uh she's been very open to having conversations with me in a way that like linnea palmasano doesn't want to yeah. talk to me and i don't blame her for that but uh <laughs> Linnea Palmasano, come on this podcast and we can get along and have a conversation. Maybe, like I said, after that forum, because of Kate Mortensen's transportation positions, wow, I I think I'm going to endorse Linnea Palmasano. Not that it matters, but uh, like that's how bad the transportation section was for me. But still, Kate Mortensen, very open to talking to me. Mm-hmm. I wonder, is that it? Is that... I'm with Kate's position on Brian. I'm wondering if that's her trying to take something that was happening during Palmasano's tenure and being like, oh, this is something that residents are really mad about. And this is something yeah. that happened during Palmasano's time. Because if there's actual, we both know the history of the Brian Avenue plan. And that was all rooted in community input. It was signed off by the mayor. like, And so... It's, I think it's her just, her just like getting, oh, she's the candidate that doesn't like Brian Avenue. Okay, there's some votes, right? right. It's a way to get some votes. Um, and it's a really smart way to get votes because it's, it's a, um, if you're trying to get votes in a certain demographic, whatever her strategy is, I don't know, I'm not a political per- 
consultant, but um, it's a polarizing topic. Yeah. Easy way to get some votes. I don't know if that would be my test on how she feels about transportation overall, because I've had some conversations with her where she's been supportive of me being a bicyclist. And so, yeah. like... Well, she's, and, been, she's been very nice to me as well. And yeah. So I like her personally, but you have to, like, take seriously what candidates say. And when the preceding answer from Paul Masano is, we need to reduce vehicle miles traveled which is like a very tepid, we need to meet the city's goals to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And then Mortensen's response to that and her answer is, except no more social engineering like on Bryan Avenue. It's like, how am I supposed to interpret that? Like one of these candidates is giving a nod to the idea of people using things other than cars for transportation. And one of them is very defensive about that. And so it's hard not to say, like, if I'm somebody who wants to bike and walk and take transit places, like, which candidate am I supposed to prefer mm. there? Am I supposed to disregard the things she said because, well, she's just playing politics? Like, you have to take seriously what candidates say about these things. Also, if you're going to do that, you could say, gee, the city really screwed up Bryan Avenue, like, in a very nondescript, vague way. I'm going to make sure that never happens again without saying, you know... Attacking the idea of like bikes over cars, like That's a good she point. she's taking yeah. it the extra step to make you think. Well, this must be about the bike aspect of the plan. So as much as I like Kate Mortensen, like I have to yeah. take seriously the things, the words that are coming out of her mouth. Right. We never. We still never. I still don't get. Still got to dig on that. The the how skinny the road is. Like, <laughs> was it always supposed to be that way, and then they just didn't get what that meant? Uh, I don't know that anyone in transportation circles realize that the fire department, what is it, 20 feet that they say they need? That's okay. So I do still, I owe the fire department a question. What was the, what was the number they gave for like? Yeah, the, for the wing. Yeah. Because I, I, I live on a street, one of those old streets and it's kind of narrow and like sometimes you got to pull over the side if somebody's driving past you. Yep. There's not space there. Am I living in a death trap because I live in a street that's not wide enough for the fire trucks to expand their wings? Right. That's. It opens up a whole question about the, the way we're designing vehicles, not just like passenger SUVs, but public vehicles have gotten so big that mm -hmm. it's impacting the way we design our streets. We think about like SUVs are so big, they have to make parking uh, stalls bigger in these parking lots uh, our park parking garage is going to have to be bigger because suvs have gotten so big and now like fire trucks are so big it's a like a reason that we disregard a council approved plan for a street and make it wider because the fire trucks can't expand their wings to put out fires but you're suggesting that the fire truck got bigger since the plan went into effect no i'm not suggesting that i'm just saying like I imagine fire trucks that are built today are larger than like whenever you see an old timey fire truck at a parade or something, you're like, mm -hmm. look at that cute little fire truck. Like fire trucks have gotten bigger over time in the same way that like old style pickup trucks are like they come up to your chest. Like you yeah. can look down. Yeah. It used to be you could look down at the driver of a pickup truck and now you can barely see over the hood in some of these pickup trucks. And I'm a tall person. Okay, for my next Pulitzer, I'm gonna get to the bottom of this fire truck thing with a with a yardstick and Brian Dobbs and the fire department. This is it's okay. People so, have been asking. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure this out because this is I can't I can't go on without knowing what's going on with this situation. One of the things I've heard is that uh, the current fire chief is more of a stickler on these things and is less less uh he values uh like alternative transportation less than the previous fire chief did or the previous fire chief was just like fine to let the city do whatever they want this is just a thing i've heard but i don't know oh so the pre so there's a suggestion here that the previous fire chief might have okayed something like this where the new fire chief would have been not okay with this plan yeah, yeah it has to do with like fire department leadership why this is 
more of an issue. Uh, and other quotes from Martinson in the Star Tribune. The enemy of progress in Minneapolis is dot, 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 mediocrity. Uh, she didn't add the question mark. I did. Uh, also, hitting uh, Palmasano on snow removal. I think that's unfair. <laughs> oh, the public services part. Yeah, that yeah. was interesting. It's another thing where it's like, this is the most recent thing that's gone bad in the city, and it's uh, Paul Masano's fault. Get- well, that's why I was, that's what I was trying to say about suggesting about Bryant Avenue, too. Like, she took Bryant Avenue and then the public services, like potholes and, yeah. and, and the snow removal, and suggested that she was like, remember all that bad stuff? Yeah. Who was who was your city council person then? Here's a, here's mm-hmm. what she said about Bryan Avenue. This and future road projects prioritize bicycles over vehicles in another section. But when comfortable relationships are prized over results, the bar is set too low. Kate Mortensen in the Star Tribune. Uh, I don't think I've read this one yet. This is the last one I'll read. If the more moderate side of the council won't provide accountability to the electorate for when the city fails them, we will find that competency comes at a price. Absent a compelling vision for the city, there exists a vacuum of leadership, but not for long. Someone is going to fill it, and the vision that prevails may hold a rebuke to the status quo with a long tail of consequences. So basically, if you don't elect me, uh, Paul Masano's dithering failure to have big, bold, solutions will lead to destruction of the city at the hands of the socialists that's my that's my uh paraphrase and then there was a letter to the editor from uh wow. which reads like it came from the palmasano campaign sometimes what campaigns do are they're like here this this story came out about us or it's re- related to the campaign we need someone to write a letter to the editor uh, to cover our perspective so be be aware that when you're reading letters to the editor from the community mm-hmm. they are often uh sponsored by a political campaign mm-hmm. uh, this is the response from a palmasano fan she has referring to mortensen mortensen has disparagingly referred to the incumbent as a manager rather than a leader what the 13th ward and all of minneapolis need right now is someone with a proven track record and that person is linnea palmasano that's it that's all they published that's all I'm going to read. Should I read okay. more? That was the, no, the part that I'll struck me. It, it was like a letter. long paragraph. I have here. I'll read. I'll read the part that preceded that. I have heard Mortensen speak on several occasions and have found her to be long on promises and short on a grasp of reality. She presents herself as a leader who will get things done, but her understanding of how things actually happen in city hall is surprising and it's naivete. The office she is seeking requires a willingness to do the hard work as part of a team, not as someone with all the answers who would rather be in the spotlight. I think it's fair to hit Paul Masano on like being there for 10 years and what do you have to show for it? What was your big, big idea? And like the things that stand out to me as a admittedly someone who doesn't like Paul Masano is her opposition to the 2040 plan. Arguments that don't make sense. She seems paralyzed by politics often. Like she has said, uh, she is for a version of rent stabilization. And then has come out pretty strongly after that topic has gone away and said, like, I'm against any of it. And so I have a hard time, like, what is true about Linnea Palmasano? What is her position? And she's got this idea that rent, rent stabilization will work, but she's also against the 2040 plan. And usually this debate gets boiled down to, do you support more supply of housing? Is that your your theory of the problem? Or do you think we need to crack down on landlords raising rents? Usually people come down on one side of that or the other. And she seems to reject both sides of that, which I don't know makes very much sense. Yeah, like I said, or like I caught in the forum, Um, She talked a lot about specific programs in the city that she is supportive of. So like stable homes, stable schools. Right. And Um, uh, things that are in the 2040 plan, like uh, single room occupancy, I think she brought up. mm -hmm. Yep. Which would not would not be here if not for the 2040 plan. I don't know if she brought up parking minimums. So anything else she uh, came out in favor of bragged about? Um. There's a affordable rent, like subsidy programs. I'm sorry, I don't have the list in front of me, but she actually had a a, a list. Um, yeah. and, um, 
But the idea that the city is going to yeah. like subsidize rents when we can barely offer a couple of million to do like public housing repairs mm -hmm. as a city, like housing money uh, comes from the federal government. It uh, housing is dependent on like the market building a lot of housing. That's where our most most people are out there living in housing built by the market either either new or decades ago and so i don't know that the city can step in with a million dollars here or five hundred thousand dollars there to like subsidize subsidize our way to an affordable city like it's going to take a lot of different things and she's rejecting some of the big ones as potential solutions though i, I imagine like she will say oh no uh, of course I support building uh, more housing, but then I don't know what her position is on the 2040 plan. Is is it that she wanted Ward 13 to be exempt from the idea of triplexes? I mean, that that sounds politically terrible, but is that her actual position? I don't know. I don't know. No. Um, do you think Kate Mortensen has a shot at winning? I don't know. I didn't include Ward 13 on my list of battlegrounds because mm -hmm. I just think Paul Masano is so entrenched, has so much establishment yeah. support. Who's going to endorse? Who in the establishment is going to like peel away from Paul Masano and endorse uh, yeah. uh, Mortensen? I don't see it happening. I do. I think there's something to admire in Kate Mortensen, like being willing to do this without anyone, any big names uh, saying they're going to get behind her. I don't know. I like guess, or she just didn't have the sense to realize how entrenched Palmasano was. <laughs> I don't want to be on here saying Kate Morrison has no no sense, but uh, I don't know. It, it's kind of difficult. I know she's got a lot of money. She's a wealthy person, and so that makes it easier. Is that all? Is that all we wanted to get to before we go? Yeah, that's it. Uh, do you have any recommendations for the audience? What fun things are you doing? What will bring a joy to people's lives if they took up a hobby that you've taken up? Sitting outside in your front or backyard and just sitting outside and enjoying the fall air is really awesome. Do you have just a, sitting there. Do you have a nice backyard to enjoy? I actually do. Um, it's fenced off. And there's no trees, which is really strange, but all my surrounding neighbors have trees and all their branches like come into my yard. So it's really nice. I also like my front yard because um, I get to see people walking by and then I get to say hi to them and then they don't say hi to me because they have their earplugs in, but that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, so that's what I've been doing when I have like just need a break. That's really fun. Um, I always say the same stuff about like going for a bike ride. Um, I just read this book called The Vegetarian, which is really cool. I've been reading books, like actual books, which is cool. And I've just been asking my friends what books they've been reading. And then they just give me a book. And that's how I read books. Like, I don't try to do it by myself. I just ask my friends what they're reading. And then that's the best way. I started an audio book and I got most of the way through it about uh, Ulysses S. Grant. It's the, the big Whoa. popular biography of Ulysses S. Grant. Did I say it was an audio book? Yeah. And so it's easier for me to make time for an audio book because I, I can be doing other things. Yes. So yes. I kind of enjoyed that. And it made me interested about uh, reading or listening, listening to more audio books about things like Reconstruction, because that seems like a very significant time in our country's history. It's remarkable the number of progressive ideas that came post Civil War, that kind of kind of took hold for a little while, and then like uh, terribly violent racist white people uh, banded together to make it go away, and it hmm. took us a very long time to get back to the gains that were made, or people were trying to make in the immediate aftermath hmm. of the Civil War. That sounds like eerily. Um, similar. It seems to be a recurring so, impulse in American culture. It's, I've heard of this quote. It's a, it goes, history repeats itself, John. Yeah. But it, it was interesting to learn about... Uh, the, we think of people in olden times as like 
very backward, like having very mm -hmm. backward opinions. And of course, they were horribly racist back then. Everyone was horribly racist back then. A lot of people weren't. A lot of people were in the middle. A lot of people did good things, but were also racist at the same time. A remarkable diversity of opinion, and I found that dynamic to be very interesting. Also, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, probably an underrated president. Seemed like a interesting guy. Cool. Uh, to bring it back to our Palmasano conversation, a very, very understated uh, leader. So... So are you saying that Palmasano is our current U Ulysses S. Grant? Maybe. <laughs> he had a lot of hard years. Another oh. injury, I don't, I don't want to go on too long about this, but he spent a long time as a failure, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. He had a drinking problem, and he had to leave the military. He failed in business for a lot of years. And then, like, out of nowhere, the Civil War happens, and he becomes this... Uh, amazing general and like not very long after being a total failure goes from the best general ever saving the country and being elected president wow yeah. that's quite a story yeah i think ron you gotta pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you too can do it ron chernow is the author Ooh. and i haven't finished it i just we got to the point where he becomes president and it got boring for me but i might finish it fair i think you got through the good parts though i did the part where he goes from failure to a tremendous success story okay melody this has been the wedge live podcast i'm your host john edwards my guest has been melody hoffman from southwestvoices.news thank you for listening this is a real real thing real 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 thing We're in the Wedge neighborhood right now, 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 right now.